Bernal can first be encountered at the Warmaster's shack in Limgrave, and his visual presence alone radiates power. He is adorned in heavy silver-plated pauldrons and greaves. This style most likely draws inspiration from Lorica Segmentata, segmented armour commonly worn by Roman legionaries. Another noteworthy item of clothing is what looks like a singular militare, a metal belt worn not just as an accessory, but as a symbolic badge of military status. Propped alongside Bernal is another visual testament to his might, a spyhander. Literally, a two-hander sword is impaled in the ground. Historically, these swords were much larger than average, measuring at least five feet long and weighing between two and four kilograms. Hence its name, a typical person would need two hands to wield such a large, heavy sword. This sword's description emphasises its sheer size, explicitly stating just about the largest sword a mere man is capable of swinging. True to its name, it is designed to be wielded in both hands, but those of merely ordinary strength will still struggle to do so. It underscores the Herculean strength required to handle such a weapon. That is why it is so impressive that Bernal uses a Zweihander and does so with one hand. Now the words big sword, one hand may have conjured up in your head some characters like Guts from Berserk or Cloud from Final Fantasy, characters who showcase both their physical strength and their exceptional skill to defy the norms of typical swordsmanship. There are instances where they don't utilise this one-handing ability at all times, indicating that it's a conscious choice based on the situation or character preference. This suggests that there are strategic benefits to using both hands in some instances. Banal's combat animations show he can effortlessly change from one and two-handed swings if you make him hostile in Limgrave. Much of this reminds me of a scene from Bleach, where Kenpachi, a savage captain who lives for a fight, says, Did you know that a sword is more powerful when you swing it with two hands instead of one? To which everyone reading and watching, and even the enemy he was fighting against, went, Well, yeah, obviously. Until now, you have only seen Kenpachi wield his sword one handed, but that was mainly as a self handicap. Difference and potency when he uses two hands is unmistakable. Two-handing weapons requires more care and timing in exchange for more power. Any great sword user can tell you that. You can't just spam, slash and run away. You have to pick your moment and lock in. But returning to Banal, he demonstrates his capability of doing both stances. His NPC programming will switch between them if you get into combat with him, and he will show you why this place is called the Warmaster Shack. He is indeed that Warmaster. But I have already gotten too far ahead of myself. I've barely introduced this guy and I've already referenced three completely different franchises. What is a video essay without a million tangents? Characters like this are larger than life and you can bring characters like these to life yourself with Display, the sponsor of this video. These aren't regular posters, they are high quality designs printed onto metal panels, individually signed off by their master of production. You can customise, collect, and rearrange them however you like. They have over a million designs, including officially licensed brands like Elden Ring, Dark Souls, Warhammer, Fallout, and World of Warcraft, just to name a few. In just 20 seconds, you can turn your bare, dull walls into a gallery of your special interests, without even drilling a hole. Simply use the cleaning wipe, press down the protective leaf, and stick the magnet onto that, and the disc plate will attach instantly to your wall. It's easy, safe, and quick, as disc plate delivers worldwide in only four to five business days. Holidays are coming, so now is the best time to buy an awesome present for your family, friends, or well, you know, yourself, because you also deserve gift. Whatever game, show, or aesthetic you like, disc plate will surely have something to match your passions. So I am offering 20% off one to two disc plates or 30% off three or more disc plates simply by using my code chalice at checkout or click the link in the description to have the discount applied automatically. That's code chalice. Thank you again so much disc plate for sponsoring this video. Now let's return to Bernal. One of the first things that Bernal says to you 
is in the form of a question. Let me ask you something. Are you here in the lands between to take up the fight? Does your faith in the guidance of grace hold firm, despite the collapse of the Golden Order? Your answer to this won't drastically alter the trajectory of his questline, but it will introduce variations in his subsequent dialogue, depending on what you answer here. His probing question is to assess your loyalty to the Golden Order. Your options to answer are a firm, yes, I'm faithful, or a more uncertain, I'm not sure. As a side note, it's interesting that there is no option to declare you are a non-believer. This likely stems from the fact that you meet Banal very early in the game. If there was a choice to say no here, it would allow players to prematurely dismiss something so fundamental at the beginning, instead of organically developing their own perspective on the state of the world as they explore. But, irrespective of your answer, Banal will remain amiable. If you affirm your faith, his response carries a hint of nostalgia. Yes, you're a tarnished through and through. Takes me back. But that's a quality needed now more than ever. This is a subtle nod to his past. Perhaps he too was once a devout Golden Order follower. That is what I will uncover later in this video. If you give the uncertain answer, Banal will appreciate your candidness. Honest to a fault, I see. Such thoughts won't behoove you as a tarnished, but there's nothing wrong with that. Using the archaic word behove, meaning befit, shows that he recognises these internal struggles are unsuitable, yet he refrains from criticising your wavering belief. Rather than dissuading you, he encourages you to preserve your faith in the Golden Order. This is done by one tiny change in his dialogue. If you answered not sure, Banal will refer to you as a good tarnished, but if you answered that you are loyal to the Golden Order, he dubs you a good and proper tarnished, adding weight to the notion that this is what you are meant to be. Banal is harbouring a past that defies the typical tarnished archetype. But I've stalled long enough. Who is Banal really, and what does he want? Banal will remain in Limgrave, offering Ashes of War for sale, modifiers that allow you to customise your weapons with different skills and abilities. This is again a testament to Banal's combat prowess. However, his existence is not just that of a simple vendor. His narrative takes a turn when you reach Volcano Manor. Entering the rebel hideout, you stumble across a seated figure adorned in that distinctive and familiar armour, yet this time with a hidden face. This helmet marks the final piece of the exquisite armour Banal wears. It's completely fine not to recognise this person as Banal initially, I certainly didn't on my first couple of playthroughs. The famous Svihander is strangely absent. Banal now clutches a unique looking scepter in its place, quite a change from the formidable sword I discussed earlier. I will also touch on the significance of this new weapon in a bit. Upon being reunited, Banal's greeting is far from a warm welcome. You. What in heaven's name are you doing here? The Volcano Manor is a pit of recusants who spit at grace and hunt our own kind. I hope you understand the weight of my words. Banal issues a solemn warning about Volcano Manor, displaying genuine concern that you do not know what you are getting into. Now, if you don't know, the quests associated with Volcano Manor consist of taking assassination contracts from the Lady of the Manor, Lady Tanith. And the targets are the Tarnished, the very same ones that you share your cursed fate with. That's what Banal is referring to by our own kind. I cover more in these two videos on the motive behind Volcano Manor, so I recommend watching them if you want to know more about this debased organisation. In essence, Volcano Manor symbolises rebellion against the Erd Tree, the Golden Order, the Great Will, all of it. As Tanith reveals, the Lord of the Manor, Rykard, refused to grovel and scrounge for power after the shattering, so he dedicated his mind and body to a life of blasphemy. His followers are known as recusants, recusant meaning someone who refuses to submit to an established authority. 
in this context and world, that is the greater will. Recusants hunt other strong tarnished, proving their mettle to be recognised as champions and earning an audience with Lord Rykard. So Bernal is shocked at your presence in this extremist establishment. In response to his warning, you can confidently express that you understand the implications of your whereabouts, to which his subsequent response will vary depending on your earlier answer to the loyalty question. If you initially responded with, I'm not sure, Bernal, acknowledging your lingering doubts, will remark, Well, as long as you understand what you're saying, you have harboured doubts from the very beginning. Perhaps this day was always lurking on the horizon. Bernal recognises that your doubt guided you away from the Golden Order, rejecting their guidance from the outset. Conversely, if your previous answer was, my faith holds firm, Bernal contemplates your decision slightly differently. I thought you were tarnished bred by virtue. Perhaps playing that part led you to your doubts, I wonder. Here he briefly ponders your former steadfast beliefs, and how that relationship with your faith led to its downfall. Regardless of your reasons for embracing your new life as a recusant, Bernal issues a final warning. One final chance to get out. A final chance to not become like him. But know that the path you walk is blasphemy and leads only to a miserable death. Before you consider hunting any of your own kind, think on that. This path will only lead to a miserable death. Foreshadowing at its finest. Should you continue the Volcano Manor questline, Lady Tanith will assign you your first contract to kill a specific Tarnished. Upon your return, Bernal, now resigned to the reality of your chosen path, reintroduces himself. So, you've blooded your sword in the hunt. Then I shall introduce myself once more. Bernal, a recusant just like you. This moment is pivotal. Bernal is the same man you met in Limgrave, but little did you know then that he was a recusant. When you consider that, it reveals Bernal as incredibly respectful and noble. He could have preyed upon your rising doubts and tried to recruit you in a vulnerable moment to join the Volcano Manor, but he didn't. He saw something in you, something good, and he tried to nurture that purity. But now, seeing as he cannot dissuade you any longer, he accepts your choice and extends his hand in camaraderie. He welcomes you, acknowledging a shared fate as brothers in arms and blood. Speaking of blood, I cannot fight the feeling that there is a blood-borne comparison here. The recusants of Volcano Manor, akin to the hunters, engage in the grim task of slaughtering their own kind, the tarnished in Elden Ring versus the so-called beasts in Bloodborne. The recusant must hunt his own kind. To raise the flag of revolt against this sanctified pillaging, we recusants must become the most wretched of predators. Bernal's dialogue, laden with references to the hunt and blood, draw a parallel to the tragic city of Yarnum. Hunters and recusants alike find themselves pitted against their own kind in a grim pursuit of slaughter that some do with gleeful bloodlust and others guilt and reluctance. After you fulfil Tanith's next contract, Bernal will invite you to join him on an exclusive side mission. This is a surreal concept when you think about it. This mission entails confronting and defeating some of the original members of the first Roundtable Hold, specifically Wilhelm and Vargram. You may recognise the latter as one of the primary characters featured in Elden Ring's promotional material, identified by his distinctive armour the Raging Wolf set showcased in marketing and concept art, and you're about to take him down side by side with Banal within the confines of the Fortified Manor, a location in Leandro that is speculated to be the original Round Table Hold. The theming, the significance, and the structure of this encounter are amazing. As I said, this is a duo invasion, you and Banal versus Wilhelm and Vargram. Amid the invasion, you get a front row seat to Bernal's change in weaponry. Instead of his favoured spy hander, you see that odd looking staff, 
but this is no magic casting staff, despite being called a scepter. This is a formidable great hammer. Let's take a closer look. A lengthy metal handle serves as the anchor for outstretched hands at its peak, seemingly reaching for a globe. Yet the main feature is the giant coiling serpent, slithering around the handle, ascending to the pinnacle with its jaws wide open, ready to devour the world. This is the Devourer's Scepter. The weapon possesses a life-stealing ability, akin to a serpent voraciously draining its prey's life force. This skill, Devourer of Worlds, will drain the HP of any nearby enemies, the snake's relentless hunger is a very fitting part of what the scepter is meant to signify. The weapon depicts a vision of the future briefly seen by Rikard in his final moments before being devoured by the great serpent. This wasn't done as a method to end his life, in fact it was very much the opposite. Rikard harboured an insatiable desire to break free from the influence of the greater will, seeking a means to live eternally outside of their control. Rikar took the form of a giant serpent so that he might devour, grow, and live eternally. So this weapon symbolises the serpent's unending appetite and prophecy that it will one day consume the entire planet. I wanted to mention the symbology of another detail, those tiny hands that adorn the top. I at first assumed they represented the world protesting at their impending demise, hands up in a panic as they were about to be plunged into nothingness. But the small hands are actually a recurring motif on another item connected to Rikard, the blasphemous blade. This sword is covered in red gore, viscera and writhing hands. These are the remains of the countless heroes he has devoured writhe upon the surface of this blade. That may be what Banal was referring to when he referred to the path of a recusant ending in a miserable death. The recusants, driven by the promise of fame, glory and the life of a champion, may have been unaware of the horrible fate that awaited them. The Lord granted them an audience, whereupon they were welcomed by the maw of the great serpent, and within the serpent's bowels they became the Lord's kin. Now it's debatable if the recusants understood what they were ultimately aiding, it's unlikely that the truth would be openly disclosed, as it would undoubtedly deter potential recruits. The prospect of slaughtering your friends only to be rewarded with one's own sacrifice to a colossal snake isn't the best incentive. Coupled with a discreet terminology, referring to the process as gaining an audience with Rikard, if this was kept a secret, the recusants unwittingly became pawns in Rikard's grand scheme. Linking this back to the Devourer Scepter, rather than resisting the serpent's consumption, you could interpret those hands as pushing, propelling the world closer to the giant gaping moor. The recusants are enabling Rikard's goal, and in his vision, he sees them as expendable tools to help him. But I went on this whole tangent about Rikard, because why does Bernal have this incredibly symbolic scepter? How does Bernal know about the fate of the recusants? Why is he a recusant in the first place? We're getting there, I promise. The aftermath of the confrontation with Rikard reveals a curious indifference among the recusants. There is no open mourning for the fallen lord of the manor. Tanith too refrains from outwardly expressing anger and grief towards you for bringing about Rikard's demise. This reaction stems from the deeply ingrained belief that strength defines worth, and upon being defeated, Rikard is deemed unworthy of grief or ire. Banal also shares the philosophy that the strong sees from the weak. I harbour you no ill will. The strong take. Such is our code. He responds matter-of-factly, and then goes on to discuss the future after the foundation of the manor has now crumbled. The Volcano Manor is no more, though we may yet fulfill an old promise. We hunted our own kind and took what was theirs, and with everything in hand, the time has come to rise against the Erd Tree. Despite their leader's demise, Banal expresses that he is still committed to upholding the recusant cause 
and rebellion against the greater will. O oh, greater will, hear my voice. I am the recusant Bernal, inheritor of my brother's will, and you will fall to my blade. We refuse to become your pawns. Consider this fair warning. So Bernal not only vows to put an end to the greater will, but he also mentions that he is the inheritor of his brother's will. With the absence of any familial context or a disclosed surname, piecing together who Bernal's brother is is a little tricky. Based on what Bernal tells you about inheriting a will, it's safe to assume that his brother is now deceased, and because he mentions this immediately after you inform him of Rykard's death, possibly does that mean... I found this theory on Reddit by Obzen96 that discusses if Bernal could be the unmentioned son of Radigan and Renala, which would make him Rykard's biological brother. I personally don't subscribe to this theory, although it is intriguing. I would encourage you to read it as there are some salient points, and it's certainly a different perspective, which is always fun and appreciated in theory crafting. I think Bernal possibly had a biological brother who was completely disconnected from Rikard and that family tree, but something happened to him, so Bernal swore to avenge him in response. But there isn't really any other evidence to further support or refute this. What I think makes the most sense is that Bernal is referring to Rikard when he references him as a brother, but it's a brother beyond the realms of blood relations. This is supported by Bernal's camaraderie language earlier, supporting the idea that he doesn't mean a familial brother, but a brother in arms. He is pledging to continue Rikard's ambitions. So how is he going to do this? For you, it's burning the Erd Tree, getting the Rune of Death, and becoming Elden Lord. Bernal's cryptic parting words allude to the fact that he has similar wishes to challenge the established order. Surely that won't become a problem later on. When you get transported to Faramazula and reach the Godskin duo fight, unexpectedly, Bernal is also here as a summon sign. This allows you to team up as allies again to take on the Godskins, harkening back to when you collaborated against Wilhelm and Vagram. Now, how did Bernal end up in Faramazula? How did you even get to Faramazula? The journey and means of transportation are unexplained, all you see is Melina putting you to sleep, saying goodbye, and the next thing you know, you're waking up in a magical tornado land. But I think because you summon Bernal, that word implies a temporary arrival into your world. The mechanism is reminiscent of the invasion system, a multiplayer feature where players enter and exit each other's worlds for specific interactions. And speaking of invasion, after the Godskin fight and on your way to reclaim the Rune of Death, as you approach the bridge, instead of taking a right to the Malaketh fight, if you go left, something unprecedented will occur. Bernal will invade you. He who was once your ally has now turned adversary. This is a shocking twist of events. The man who you just summoned in the same area to help you with a fight is now forcefully ripping through the fabrics of your reality to kill you. And I haven't even skipped any dialogue or events here. This happens immediately if you go to this location. Sadly, Banal refrains from talking or elucidating on its motive. But the items he drops provide us with some valuable insights. One of the items is the Blasphemous Claw, a peculiar looking stone, a slab of rock engraved with the traces of the Rune of Death, can deflect the power of the Black Blade. This is a pretty crazy item for Banal to have, for reference, the Black Blade is the weapon Malaketh uses as the appointed guardian of the Rune of Death, and this rock has part of that power engraved on it. Gameplay-wise, it works similarly to Margit's and Moog's Shackle as an optional tool to assist with boss fight mechanics. This stone can parry some of Malaketh's potent attacks by negating the effect of the Rune of Death. Once again, why does Banal have this item? The description of the claw reads, On the night of the dire plot, Rani rewarded Praetor Rikard with these traces. Should the coming trespass one day transpire, they would serve as a last resort foil, allowing Rikard to challenge Malaketh, the Black Blade, 
the black beast of destined death. The claw gifted by Rani to Rikard presumably was a contingency plan should Rikard need to fight Malekith. So let's consolidate what we know. Banal has the Blasphemous Claw. Banal has the Devourer's Scepter. Banal has a brother. Banal's possession of these items and a brotherly bond suggest he was very close with Rikard. He was likely bestowed them by Rikard. I don't think he stole them, because he does have the Devourer's Scepter when you meet him in Lingrave. He won't use it in combat, but he will drop it as an item. The Blasphemous Claw, however, can only be obtained at the very end after the invasion, so this timing may hint that Banal retrieved it post Rikard's defeat, unopposed to some corpse looting, but it is also entirely possible that Rikard could have presented it to him before he sacrificed himself to the snake. So how Bernal acquired it is ambiguous, but that is not the critical thing to focus on here. Why does Bernal deem it vital to kill you in this very moment? What transpired between your co-op Godskin duo fight and the approach to the Malekith fight? That might have something to do with what Bernal discovered when he came to Faramazula. I've purposely not mentioned this yet, as that's the item description for Bernal's armour, the Beast Champion said. Silver armour engraved with tiny beasts. Beasts are drawn to champions and to lords, and this armour befits a champion worthy of becoming a lord, and that is what Bernal was. This sheds light on his high-ranking role within Volcano Manor and his potential claim to the title of New Elden Lord. So when Banal came to Faramazula, he may have grappled with newfound insights into his character, specifically when encountering its inhabitants. The Azula Beastmen here are likely those same beasts referenced in his armour description. It's plausible that these beings were drawn to him in reverence or acknowledgement of Banal's prowess, which contributed to his self-realisation of worthiness. So when Banal arrived at Faramazula, his newfound validation may have gone to his head and caused him to turn on you. That also explains why, where the invader spawns, there are a lot of beastmen who will technically help him with the fight. I'm unsure if other invaders have this kind of mechanic or if the beastmen just coincidentally happen to be around where his invader spawn is. I can't help but disagree with the conclusion that the power went to his head and caused him to turn on you. The banal you knew was honourable and had your best interests in mind from the beginning. I find it far too reductive to conclude that he just became power hungry. Let us tread the path of the recusant together till we reach the miserable death that awaits us. However, these lines suggest an awareness that Banal knew that you had a shared journey that would always culminate in the death of either one of you. Hence, he's trying to warn you from the beginning that if you become a recusant, you will always have to face him in the end. But as a counterpoint, note that the confrontation in Faramazula is not a boss battle, like when Gideon confronts you. Your encounter with Banal is an invasion. This introduces the possibility that the Red Spirit encounter here may not be the same as the real Bernal wherever he is. Invader spirits could exist as echoes at different points in time with unfinished business. For example, Millicent randomly invades you in Caled, but this has no impact on her quest, nor does she acknowledge it ever happening. In addition, if you kill the Dung Eater's invader form, his actual form is still alive elsewhere, and this time does have memories of the invasion. So, it's uncertain if Banal is still alive after you defeat his invader, because there are no further encounters with him to confirm this. But I believe this is a vengeful projection of Banal because of something tragic that happened to him. And that revelation is mentioned in the final line of his armour description. Banal was worthy of becoming a lord until his maiden threw herself into the fire. Another dramatic and tragic turn of events in Bernal's story is when his maiden set herself alight, which caused him to forego his mission of becoming Elden Lord. Using the term maiden in conjunction with fire draws immediate parallels to Melina. She is the kindling that successfully sets fire to the Erd Tree as part of her sacrifice and purpose. There is an implication that Bernal's maiden attempted to do the same, but 
seemingly failed, hence why Bernal did not achieve Elden Lord. Enia shed some light on the necessary components needed to do so. A special kindling is required to reignite the flame. For the flame to burn the earth tree, a sacrifice is needed of one who envisions the flame. If Banal's maiden did not meet these criteria, her sacrifice may have been in vain, leading to Banal's desolation and eventual abandonment of both her and his goal. Alternatively, it may not have been the result of the act that drove him away, but the act itself. Witnessing your maiden sacrifice themselves would shatter anyone's resolve. This aligns with Melina's strategy of putting you to sleep before burning herself to reduce the trauma of witnessing such an unsettling act. Perhaps seeing his maiden do the same affected Bernal so intensely that it became his last straw, turning to the life of a recusant. Only we knew more about Bernal's maiden and her thoughts. Oh no, wait, we do. While banging my head against my desk trying to make sense of lore, I typed Banal Maiden into YouTube to explore other people's findings, and what popped up was my cut content saviour, Sekiro Doobie. In their data mining, they found an unnamed character, only in the Japanese text, who, based on their dialogue, we can conclude is Banal's Maiden. And she is alive. When greeted, Banal's Maiden speaks of burning herself. Please... Look at my body. I have burnt myself countless times. I am certain I have become kindling. She has attempted to prove her worthiness as a kindling maiden through a self-inflicted and painful process. Her story and possible quest appear to be about finding the right kind of fire to burn herself with. At one point she mentions the flame I burnt myself with is also used to prevent the scarlet rot. It is a special fire that can never be extinguished. This fire that can cleanse scarlet rot is most likely in the form of an incantation called Flame Cleanse Me. This is from the Fire Monk subclass of spells which use the Giant's Flame, also known as the Flame of Ruin as their source. Later in her dialogue, she seems to confirm this. While searching for a flame to burn me, I happened upon them. The monks of the giant's flame hail from the snowy mountain tops. Despite her attempts and dedication to become a kindling maiden, it appears she doesn't find much success. This possibly suggests that being a kindling maiden is an innate quality, rather than something one can obtain through repeated practice. Her dialogue is filled with empty hope, and it's unclear if she is making progress. Lord Tarnished, am I becoming your kindling? Will we both walk path together? Lord Bernal. The mention of Bernal's name here is poignant, as if she's reflecting on her actions, and somewhat crestfallen that she couldn't do the same for her previous master. Her mental state appears to be deteriorating, and ironically enough, she does reference madness when she talks about the burning walls and Caled, and how they protect from the scarlet rot. These walls have been set ablaze and stretch wide to protect against it. However, even now, the inside boundaries of the wall have rotted. Not a sane person remains, herself included. Knowing what his maiden is like, it's more understandable why Bernal did not become Elden Lord. With all the pieces now, it's likely that Banal, guided by the finger readers, may have been advised about needing special kindling. His maiden became obsessed, unable to acknowledge she was simply not cut out to be a kindling maiden, and eventually succumbed to madness. The tragic end of her dialogue implies her inevitable death, irrespective of your actions or sentiments towards her. In typical FromSoft fashion, her endeavours were futile, an outcome fruitless. I recommend watching Sakura Doobie's video for her full dialogue recreation or reading the extensive spreadsheet of text and translations by Robido the Red, Claude and Odo Kuro. All links will be in the description. So where does that leave us with Banal? Well, the cut content does open more doors than it does close. 
As I said earlier, I believe his invasion is unrelated to the relationship he built up with you. I like to think of his red spirit as the manifestation of his anger towards the unfair sacrifice required to make him Elden Lord, and so whoever would next venture into Faramazula would face his wrath for their ruthlessness in using their own maiden as a tribute. Banal's past and relationships with the Golden Order, Volcano Manor, and his maiden paint a character burdened by the weight of his choices. The order in which these events occurred is still up to interpretation. I think Banal was first initially loyal to the Golden Order, and we know this because he uses two Golden Order spells in combat. Protection of the Erd Tree and Gold Vow. These are the Erd Tree subclass of incantation and require faith to cast. The Golden Vow states, this incantation has been taught to knights of the royal capital for generations and knights sent on distant expeditions lean on it as a source of courage. The royal capital of Leendal, so Banal was originally a royal knight and a candidate for the next Elden Lord, until the incident with his maiden. He lost faith in the Erd Tree and what the Golden Order stood for. He went to Volcano Manor and swore to live the life of a recusant. Interestingly, when you first talk to Tanith, she does reference another Tarnish who arrived without invitation, which may have been Banal. He was not sought after by them, but voluntarily surrendered himself, freezing his heart and mind for the cause of rebelling. The beasts, their eyes and ears covered, represent an oath. See nothing, hear nothing, doubt nothing, and carry on along the path set in stone. Suppose we follow the theory that invader spirits are entirely different entities than their real-life counterparts. In that case, there is still a possibility that Banal is alive and out there somewhere. A bittersweet feeling rose in my heart when I returned to the manor to see if there was any other clues left behind, and that's where his story came full circle. There, propped against his usual seat by the fire, stands his faithful Zweihander the trusty weapon of a man who only knew the blade. Banal is a character I certainly didn't expect to do such a deep dive on, but that's what I love about Elden Ring and Souls games. Please let me know your interpretation of Banal's quest. Do you perceive him as a cold-hearted recusant who values strength and nothing else? Or a lost man who tried to make things right, but in the end just wanted to die at the hands of a friend? Or both? Or neither. Please let me know. Thank you everybody for watching and thank you for such a warm welcome back to my revisiting of Elden Ring. A special thank you goes out to my patrons and channel members.